Today I'll be teaching the game 1846, The Race for the Midwest. This is a game that was designed by Tom Lehman. It originally was published by a company called Deep Thought Games, but recently it was reissued in a new edition by GMT Games. This is episode 4 of 5. So I've explained the heart of the game, but I want to explain a few more things. First thing I want to explain is how you start the game, how you set it up. So to set up the game, you'll have the charters and the tokens and the stock shares. You'll have them off to the side. You'll have the track tiles all over here to the side. You'll put the big four and you'll put the Michigan Southern uh, token uh, out because those companies are going to start. Those are private companies. You'll put the phase marker and the round marker here. Here's the Michigan Southern. And you will take one of these player order cards for each player. I'm going to illustrate a four player game. The game can play with three, four, or five, but for purposes of demonstrating the setup and the initial start, I'm going to use four. So in a five, four player game, you're not going to use the number five. So what you'll do is you'll shuffle these up. Each player will get one. You'll hand them out to the four players. And then you will reorder the seating order so that it goes one, two, three, four. So in this case, um, we would shuffle around so that we go in that order. Um, some groups um, want to have one player be the banker and that player has a spot for it or one player uses a spreadsheet on a computer. So you may want to let that player stay where they are and you all readjust around them. But in any case, you're going to readjust so that the player's in order. Then you've finished with these uh, order cards. Then you're going to adjust the bank size. If you don't take money out of the bank, the bank's going to go longer than you were expecting to 6,500, 7,500, or 9,000. In the case of a four-player game, we would use 7,500. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to adjust the trains. You've got to be careful about this, but you see here on the board that it says that with four players, you use six phase one trains. With five players, you use seven. There are seven phase one trains included in the game, but since we're imagining playing with four players, we're only going to use six of them. We're going to remove one yellow train from the game because there are only four players. We're also going to use only uh, five uh, green trains. We're going to remove one of those from the game. Notice that all of these have a three, five on one side and a four on the other side, so they all can be bought in either configuration. Once you buy them, though, you can't change them. And finally, we're going to use only four of these brown trains. If you don't want to have to look it up every time, you can do it this way. There are always the same number of brown trains in the game as there are players. So in a four-player game, there are four brown trains. There's one more green train than brown train. This would be five. And there's one more yellow train than green train. So it's four, five, and six. The supply of gray trains is unlimited, so you don't have to take those out unless you want to. The next thing we do is we remove some items from the game in terms of companies. In the five-player game, there are seven companies. I described two of them, but there are five more of them. And if you look at the, um, the stock certificates, you will see, for example, the Chesapeake and Ohio stock certificate has a green diamond. There are two other corporations that have green diamonds. The Pennsylvania, the Chesapeake and Ohio, and the Erie have green diamonds. When you play a five-player game, you use all seven of these uh, companies. When you play a four-player game, you randomly remove one of these companies from the game. Let's imagine that we remove the Chesapeake and Ohio. When you remove a company from the game, you take one of its tokens and you place it in the home space. So we would take the CNO token and put it in Huntington. When a city has all of its spaces filled up with tokens, then any company that's not one of those companies cannot go past it. You could run to Huntington here, but you could not run to Charleston. And so by placing the CNO token here, the CNOs are not in play, but that doesn't mean any company can go to Charleston. So you remove a company. 
If you play with three, you remove two of these green diamond corporations from the game and you place tokens in two of those spaces, just blocking to keep the board from being too open. So in a four player game, we would play with six corporations. And then we look at the privates. I told you that I would explain these later. There are three sets of privates. There are three privates with orange circles on them. There are three privates with blue squares on them. And there are four privates with neither circles nor squares on them. So there are 10 private companies in all. In a five player game, you play with all 10 of these, two per player. In a four player game, you randomly remove one orange and one blue from the game. So in a five, four player game, we would do this and we'd say we're gonna remove that one from the game. Uh, that one's the Michigan Central and you would play with the other two. And similarly, you would say I'm gonna remove one of these from the game randomly. That's the Tunnel Blasting Company and I would play with two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Again, two per player. In a three player game, we would remove two of the oranges and two of the blues and we would have six privates. Again, two per player. That doesn't mean every player is going to have two. It means that the number of them in the game is two per player. For example that I'm doing a four player game, we're going, to have, um, we're going to have eight of them. Then you go back to these player order to cards, one, two, three, four, and you're going to add them to the privates. Now these numbers were useful in determining the initial seating order, but for the purposes of the rest of the process, they're just blanks. They're all the same. So you take the six, eight, or 10 private companies, and you take the three, four, or five player number cards, and you shuffle these up. And there's going to be a draft at the start of the game in which each player uh, has the opportunity, and sometimes the obligation, uh, to take one or more of these privates. Again, I've removed these two. We're gonna talk about them all later, but I'm gonna remove them to, from the game uh, to, to uh, to, uh, to illustrate. And let's say that we had made this player number one, this player number two, this player number three, and this player number four. The player who's first gets this card, the priority deal marker. That means that that player is going to start uh, the action in the stock rounds. Remember, players take turns in stock rounds. Uh, they don't take turns in operating rounds. Player order is meaningless in operating rounds. But let's say this player here uh, is gonna take turn first in the stock round. In order partly to make up for that advantage, uh, we draft the private companies in reverse player order. So instead of clockwise from the person with the priority deal, we're gonna go counterclockwise from the person to the right of the priority deal player. And the process is we have this stack of private companies and we deal out two more than the number of players. So in a four player game, we're gonna deal off six. In a five player game, we'd deal seven. In a three player game, we'd deal five. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's this player here. And this player would look at this and would take one of these privates or would take a blank. If the player takes a private, it means that they're going to commit to buying this before the first stock round. So let's say this person says that one looks good to me and they put it under there. Then they take the rest of these privates, in this case five, they shuffle them up and they put them under the stack and they pass it to the right. Notice this player last in Priority order is first in drafting order. This player drives, draws six off. And they look at them. And they think about what they want and they say, I would like that one. And they shuffle up the other five and they put it under the stack. And then this player deals off six. And they look at them and you know, just for variety, this player might say, I'm gonna take a blank. I don't wanna take anything. Um, this stack had a one and a four blank. It doesn't matter which one you take. They're all the same in this process. And shuffles up. And passes it to the right. This player drills off six. And they look at it. And let's say they take this. They shuffle these up. They pass them to the right. This player back to that player. And notice that uh, it's going to happen that some of the ones that come back are ones that you've already seen. So this player takes this, 
shuffles them up, puts them under. I'm, I'm, I'm describing this at length because there's a couple of implications that aren't obvious until you see it. So this player looks here, takes one, shuffles them up and puts them under. Actually, there are five here and there's one here, so you really don't have to shuffle at this point because there's six and this player is going to get them all. And let's say this player looks at them and uh, takes this one. This player now only gets five because we're down to only five. They get all the ones that are there. And so this player looks at these and if a player in this process gets a hand and they're all blanks. That means all the private companies have been taken by people and you can stop. <laughs> but until that happens, uh, they can't. So this player takes this one. No more shuffling needed. Uh, this player takes this one. This player takes this one. Notice if you get a hand with no blanks, you still have to take a private. And let's say this player takes this one. It gets to this player. If this were a blank, it would be over. But if this is not a blank, this player with a priority deal turns it over. In this case, it's the mail contract. And they may buy it for the price, $80. But they might say, well, you know, I've spent a lot of money. I really don't want to want it. They can then pass it onto the right, in which case this player can get it for $10 less, for $70, and take it, a better deal. If they don't want it, they pass it to this person who can get it for $60. It keeps going around with the price going down until either somebody takes it or eventually the price goes down to zero, at which pace point you must take it, but you'd be happy to take it at zero. So let's imagine that this player took it at $70. So what we've done is through this draft process, it distributed all the privates to the players. So then the players turn the privates up. All of these blanks that came out, uh, they're set aside. We won't need them in the game anymore. This player took a blank. This player took a blank. This player took a blank. And notice that we had um, eight companies in the game. This player got two, this player got two, this player got one, and this player got three. No guarantee that you will all get two, but there's two per player. And now each player would pay out of their starting cash. Each player starts the game with $400. Initial capital, $400. <laughs> Bank size removed from the green diamonds, the orange circles, and the blue squares. So this is the, the starting rules. But you start $400. This player would have to pay the bank for their privates. This is an independent railroad. So one thing that we would do is we would find the Michigan Southern's train. It's not these trains. And we would give it to the Michigan Southern. And we would find the Big Four's train and give it to the Big Four. And now we would pay. The cost of the Michigan Southern is $60 plus $80, $140. And the cost of the steamboat is $40. So the total cost of these two companies would be $180. This player would pay $180 to the bank and be left with $220 for stock round one. This player here would pay $60 for this, $40 for this. And remember, in the example, we have only $70 for this, $170 they'd pay $170 to the bank, be left with $230. Uh, this player would pay $100 for the big four, 40 plus 60, and $40 for the Lakeshore line, they'd pay $140 to the bank and be left with $260. Notice that when you're buying it at the beginning from the bank, its cost is the 40 plus the 60. You could imagine that the amount listed as debt uh, goes to buy the train and the token. Pretty good deal to get a two train and a token for $80 or even for $60. Although I'll point out that Detroit is a better city than Indianapolis in this game. This is a Z city and this is not. So maybe it makes out. So all the players would then pay the money to the bank and they'd be left with different amounts of cash. And then we would start operating stock round one with this player being the first player in the priority deal. Oh, this player would only pay 60, so it would have $340 left at the beginning of the game. And this player could float a new corporation or possibly could pass. Probably they would want to float a new corporation. That is the way the private companies are distributed. So the remaining thing for me to teach you is the properties of the private companies and the properties of the corporations. So I'm going to explain those in several steps. First, I'm going to take the 
private companies that have orange dots. And these are cheap privates with track building powers. So the Ohio and Indiana is a private that first of all pays you $15 uh, every operating round. Remember the start of an operating round, it pays its income to its owner, whether a player or a corporation. These privates cannot do anything while they're owned by a player. However, uh, at any point during the company's, the corporation's operating round turn, it may buy the private from the player paying one to $40. It could pay one. You might say, why wouldn't I have it pay 40? Well, maybe your corporation needs a little more capital and you sell it at a discount. What this Ohio and Indiana does, here's the Ohio and Indiana list on the board, is first of all, while it's owned by a player, no one can lay track in these two hexes. Then once it's owned by a corporation, um, it gives two extra free track lays here or one free track lay if you want. So one thing that you might want to do, uh, let's say you're the B&O or the, the Pennsylvania that bought it in, it might want to lay some track here starting to build a route from east to west. Remember, east to west is a theme of this game and sometimes gives you nice bonuses. It could lay any two plain track tiles as long as they meet in the middle. It could also, instead of being helpful, it could lay fairly useless track tiles as long as they meet in the middle. Presumably you would lay track like this if you didn't want these corporations to do well. It can only do this during the operating round <laughs> turn of a corporation that has owned them. I'll also say that once a corporation has bought a private from a player, uh, that's going to stay with the corporation until the privates go away in phase three. Second corporation is the Michigan Central, which is just like the Ohio and Indiana, except that it involves these two hexes. In particular, Holland is a good city. If you wanted to build, say, from Detroit to Holland, um, your corporation could potentially uh, lay those two with the use of the Michigan Central. That would cost it nothing. You wouldn't have to pay $20, and it wouldn't even count toward the $20, uh, the two, it wouldn't even count toward the two tiles you're allowed to lay in a turn. So it kind of accelerates track building, gives a nice income to the player or a nice income to the company that buys it. However, once the corporation has bought this, even if you haven't laid the track, some other corporation or independent railroad could lay the track. The Lakeshore Line is like the Ohio and Indiana and Michigan Central, uh, but it's a little bit different. You see this as LSL pointing to Cleveland and Toledo. What the Lakeshore Line does is it allows you to upgrade either a Cleveland yellow tile or a Toledo yellow tile from yellow to green for no money and again not counting as the corporation's track lay for the turn. So let's say you were again the New York Central and let's say in the first operating round as I suggested you laid two tiles like that. Then you would like to have this tile laid and these both be green but that would be three tile lays. If you had the Lakeshore line you could um, do that in one operating round. You could say, I'm going to play an upgrade here for $20. I'm going to play this for $20. And I'm going to use the Lakeshore Line special power in order to upgrade Cleveland to green. And that would be a fairly lucrative set of routes that you could run using the power of the Lakeshore Line. Again, it can be used either for Toledo or Cleveland, but not both. If you use these special powers, the corporation that owned them still gets to keep these. It's just that the special powers are done and uh, it still collects income though. I will say that although the Michigan Central and the Ohio and Indiana have the power of laying two track, you could also decide to lay only one track if you want instead of laying two. And uh, as I've illustrated, this track does not have to be connected to the track of the laying corporation. It could just be played uh, separately, whether you did it like this or you did it like this, you could just play it out here uh, independently. So these are the three track laying companies. Then we have three companies with blue squares. These are a little bit more complicated. Two of them cost $60 and one of them costs $40. They pay income of $10, $15, and 20 
Let's start with the tunnel blasting company. A corporation that owns the tunnel blasting company uh, can play mountains for $20 less. Remember, mountains are the brown ones with the points going up. So a $40 mountain could be laid for $20 if the corporation owns the tunnel blasting company. Note that that's the normal price. $20 is the normal price. Or it could lay a $60 tile for only $40. Or it could lay one of these tunnels, and instead of paying 60 or 40, could pay 40 or 20. And if you want to build the Windsor to Detroit connection, that would be an advantage up there. That's the tunnel blasting company. Again, all of these last until phase three. Then we have the meat packing company. The meat packing company, instead of giving you a discount on something, gives you a benefit of more revenue. The meat packing company comes with two little cattle tokens. You can see the cattle token there. And what the corporation may do is it may create a meatpacking plant in two places. You see the, the cattle symbols. It can place a meatpacking plant either in St. Louis or in Chicago. What you do is you place it there and you place the other token, let's say it's the Illinois Central, on the corporation charter. For that corporation only then, as long as those markers stay there, this city is worth $30 more for any train that runs to it. So if the Illinois Central ran to St. Louis, instead of being 50 in yellow, it would be worth 80 in yellow. If it ran two trains to St. Louis, both of them would count St. Louis as 80 in yellow. These markers are the ones that are referred to here in the phase chart. You remove the private companies in phase three, but these markers remain until phase four. That's what it means, remove private company markers. So in phase three, uh, the meatpacking company would make St. Louis worth 100. In phase four, unfortunately, the meatpacking would go away. So that's the meatpacking company. And finally, we have the steamboat company. It's a little bit lower on the dollar side, both from a cost and an income, but it's more flexible on the revenue side. The steamboat company comes with two steamboat markers. They look like this. And there are a number of spaces on the game, game board that have anchors. There's Chicago Connections. Holland has two anchors. There's Toledo. Wheeling has two anchors. And St. Louis has an anchor. The steamboat company can place one of these markers on a hex and the other marker on a company charter. And that makes that city worth $20 extra for each anchor. So if it's a two anchor city, it's actually worth $40 instead of $20. Often, the person who owns the steamboat company may start the B&O Railroad, and as soon as Wheeling is upgraded to green, <coughs> this city is now worth 30 and 20 and 20 is 70, which is a lot of money early in the game. The steamboat company has a property that's different from the meatpacking company. Uh, all of the other privates really only exercise their powers once they're bought by corporations. But the steamboat company's power can be used before it's bought by a corporation. Uh, at the beginning of the operating round, when the private companies are paying their income, uh, the steamboat company may assign its steamboat to a city and a corporation uh, before it has been bought in. So for example, uh, if you owned the B&O Railroad, but you did not um, want to buy in the steamboat company yet, you could assign the marker to Wheeling and then assign uh, the other marker to the B&O Railroad. When the steamboat company is bought in by a corporation, it may at that time, during the corporation's operating round, move the steamboat marker. So the steamboat marker could be in two places for that operating round, one at the beginning and one when the company is bought in. The steamboat company, after it's bought in, can continue to move its marker at the beginning of every operating round until phase three, when the steamboat company goes away, like all the other privates, uh, but the marker stays where it is. It can't move, but it still benefits the corporation if the corporation is using that, uh, that city. So those are the three blue privates. This is episode four of five.